الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم gave his army instructions. What was this? What are we talking about? The battle of Badr. He gave his army instructions that you all Muslims need to make sure that you hold up the banners of the Muslims. The banners of the Muslims is what differentiates in an army whether your team is winning or losing. And essentially, what it is is they can close in on you. So shoot at them. Don't just start firing your arrows haphazardly in a confused state. Stay calm. Control yourselves. And when they close in on you, they come close, then start shooting them and preserve your arrows. Gather your arrows because they were low on ammo. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling them, preserve your arrows. Don't just fire in any direction in a terrified state. Wait until they come close within firing range and then shoot them. This narration is in Bukhari. In another narration, Abu Dawood, he says, do not draw out your swords until they are near to you. So continue firing arrows, and then when it's almost hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's when you draw out your swords. Subhanallah, when the battle started, the mushrikeen started seeing the Muslims as double their number in the battle of Badr. Remember we said, before battle started, the mushrikeen would see the Muslims as less than they were. So they were them less than 300. Now when the battle started, the mushrikeen were seeing the Muslims as double this, 600. So the mushrikeen that are a thousand, see the Muslims as being 2,000. Whereas they're only 319 or 317. Subhanallah. Wallahu Li'ulil Abusar. Subhanallah. Surat Ali Imran 313. Already there has been for you a sign in the two armies that met. One fighting in the cause of Allah. And another one of disbelievers. They saw them to be twice their number. This is in the Quran. By their eyesight. But Allah supports with His victory whoever He wills. Indeed, in that is a lesson for those of vision. So in the beginning, they see them as less than their own number. So they become really enraged and they're like, we're going to defeat them, we're going to kill them. Now when the fighting starts, they're seeing them as multiplied. Double their number, triple their number. Now it destroys their morale. I thought there was only a few, but there's so many. The Muslims had a battle cry, a war cry. Do you know what that was? Ahad, 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 Ahad. That was their battle cry. One, one. One, one, one what? One Allah. This is something that they would have in their battles. They would have a war cry that they would keep on repeating. It's a chant. Abu al-Bukhtari was one of the noble men of Quraysh. He was a mushrik, he was a disbeliever. But he was not cruel to the Muslims. Some of the mushrikeen were cruel. In fact, he was one of the men who participated in the ending of the siege the, against the Muslims. If you remember in Mecca, there was a siege that lasted for three years against Banu Hashim and Abu ba Banu Muttalib, the family of the Prophet ﷺ, where they weren't allowed to eat. They were having the leaves on the trees for three years. So Abu al-Bukhtari was one of the people that ended this siege. So the Prophet ﷺ was grateful. So he asked the Muslim, if you see Abu al-Bukhtari, don't kill him. And the Prophet ﷺ, and there's a lesson to learn here, that you know some disbelievers... Even though they're disbelievers, if they do you good, then reciprocate. Do good by them. If you see him, don't kill him, the Prophet ﷺ said. So one of Ansar saw Al-Bukhtari in the battle. He was about to, but he said, you are not allowed to be killed. He had a companion with him. Well, he said, what about my companion? The Ansari said, oh, we're going to kill him. Al-Bukhtari said, then I'm going to protect my companion. I'm going to fight to protect him. And thus, the Ansari was forced to fight Al-Bukhtari, and he killed him. Then he went back to the Prophet ﷺ, very sad, and he said, 
I swear by Allah, O Prophet of Allah, I did try and take him prisoner and bring him to you, but he insisted on fighting me. So I fought back and I killed him. Al-Aswad Al-Makhzumi, another person. I'm giving you snippets of the battle, I can't give you an entire uh, scene of the battle. Um, was another man from Quraysh. He made an oath. He was an enemy, he made an oath. I'm going to reach to the wells and drink from them. And remember, I told you that the wells of Badr belong to who? The Muslims. Okay? So he marches forth from the enemy to go towards the wells of Badr, which are located behind the Muslims. And Hanza radiallahu an jumps in front of him and strikes him his leg. So his leg came off. And Al-Aswad fell on his back with his leg in the air spurting blood towards the army of Quraysh. But he was so arrogant, he was so stubborn, that he continued crawling towards the wells of Badr and reached the wells of Badr. But Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, yani, he's just looking at him, he's crawling, so he just killed him. So whether this was the first person to die in the battle of Badr, or it was the three men that had hand-to-hand combat duel, Allah alam. It is not clear in the narrations. Anyway, Haritha radiallahu an was shot by a stray arrow. He was one of the Muslims. So he was killed by friendly fire. When the battle was over, his mother met with the Prophet ﷺ. She said, tell me whether Harith is in paradise so that I'll be happy, or if he's not, then I'll cry for him because he died from friendly fire. The Prophet ﷺ told her, have you gone crazy? There are plenty of gardens in paradise and your son has earned the very highest of them. Your son is in the highest level of Jannah. Because Allah has prepared exclusively for the people that give their life for Allah. 100 levels on top of Jannah. And Haritha is in the highest one of those levels. So subhanAllah. Uh, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ إِذْ تَقُولُوا لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَلَيْ يَكْفِيَكُمْ أَنْ يُمِدَّكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ بِثَلَاثَةِ آلَافٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُنْزِلِينَ بَلَا إِنْ تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا وَيَأْتُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْرِهِمْ هَذَا يُمْدِدْكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ بِخَمْسَةِ آلَافٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُسَوِّمِينَ وَمَا جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بُشْرَ لَكُمْ وَلِتَطْمَعِنَّ قُلُوبُكُمْ بِهِ وَمَا النَّصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ سبحان الله This is Ali Imran 3.123-126 And already had Allah given you victory at the battle of Badr while you were weak You were few in number, you were like 300 against a thousand. Then fear Allah, perhaps you will be grateful. Remember when you said to the believers, is it not sufficient for you that your Lord shall reinforce you with 3,000 angels? Previously we said it was 1,000. That was the minimum number that Allah could have sent. Then it became 3,000. Then it could be more, 5,000. And then Allah says, yes, if you remain patient and conscious of Allah, and they, the enemy, come upon you, attacking you in rage. Your Lord will reinforce you with 5,000 angels. Verse of the Qur'an is revealed, having marks of distinction. And Allah made it not except a sign of glad tiding for you, to reassure your hearts that your small numbers, it's not going to be the reason why you're going to lose. We didn't even need 5,000 angels. It was only to reassure your hearts. Victory is not except from Allah. The mighty and wise. So in what form did the angels participate in the battle? We talked about this last time and we'll talk about it again. Jibreel salam himself joined in. He said, I myself saw Jibreel salam taking his horse and leading it. And all of the angels were wearing white turbans in another narration. Except Jibreel who was wearing a yellow turban. Because he was the leader of the army of angels on that day. In Sahih Muslim, It says, while one of the Muslim warriors was vigorously pursuing one of the other in unbelievers, he heard a whip and a rider's voice saying, Giddy up, Hezum, Aqdim Hezum, 
I mentioned this last time. This is just another narration. When the Muslim warrior looked at the disbeliever, he, was, he found him prostrating on the ground. So he turned him over, and he found that the man's nose had been smashed, and his, split, uh, his face was split apart by a whip. And it was all black in color. It was a whip of fire. The warrior, Al-Ansari, went and told this to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, you speak true. That was help from the third heaven. This was an angel riding the horse called Hazum. And in one another narration, I told you last time that this was Jibreel Islam himself. Ibn Ishaq narrates another story. Al Ghafari man said that I and my cousin of mine was present. We were still non believers. There were two young men that were mushrikeen. They came to the Battle of Badr just to watch, they were spectators. So they went up to a hill. Uh, it was desert, so they went up to a big hill and they were just watching. Okay? So they were lying down watching waiting for the battle to take place, to see who will win. And then a cloud approached. When it drew near the mountain, we heard the sound of horses galloping from the clouds. Aqdim hayzum, giddy up hayzum. My companions, uh, his cousin suffered a heart attack, he died on the spot. He said, I almost expired as well. So this is a shocking thing that from the clouds, this, these voices are coming in the middle of a desert. And al Masjidi says, that while I was pursuing one of the mushrikeen, suddenly his head flew off. So I realized that he was killed by someone other than me. So they could distinguish the casualties of the angels, the angels, from the Muslims very easily. How? I mentioned this last time as well. Um, Anas ibn Malik said that we could differentiate it. The angels that when they killed, they had been struck in such a way that it occurred always above their neck and all of their fingertips had been burned and become black. So the deaths that were caused by the angels, you can tell who was killed by the angels. First of all, because it was a surgical cut. And because it was black, it was burnt, it was cauterized, right? As, as if the sword or the whip was made out of fire. Not only did the angels kill, but they also captured... Prisoners of war for the Muslims. Abbas says, O Messenger of Allah, one of the Ansar was dragging Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas said, O Messenger of Allah, this is not the man who captured me. A bald, fine-looking man on a piebald horse whom I had never seen in Mecca before took me prisoner. So the Ansari said, No, it was me who captured you. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Keep quiet. Allah gave you help of a normal angel, okay? Don't try and take the credit, okay? Ibn Abbas radiallahu an said, the only battle that the angels participated in is Badr. And the other battles, they came down and they reinforced the hearts of the believers but didn't actually fight physically. Some scenes from the battlefield of Badr. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf radiallahu an said that he was flanked by two young men, okay? So you know when you're about to fight, you look at the guy on your right, you look at the guy on your left, okay? Because these guys, if they fall, what is going to happen to you? You're going to fall. So you need to have good people on your right and left, right? So you need to have good fightings, companions. So now, who did he look to his right? Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was like, there was a kid on my right side, and there was a kid on my left side. I'm a mature man, sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ, and I have these two youngsters next to me. So he preferred to have a mature person next to him. But yani, he can't change the order now. So now he said, the one to my right, now listen to this, he whispered to him. He said, oh uncle, show me which one is Abu Jahl. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf said, what do you want with Abu Jahl, the leader of the other army? What are you talking about? He said, I swore to Allah, uncle, that if I saw him, I would kill him or I would die in front of him. Either I kill him or I die in front of him. In front of his eyes. So now Abdul Rahman ibn Auf is starting to change his opinion about the young boy that's next to him. Okay? You know, don't base your opinion on looks. Don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah? So now this man right next to me wants to kill the leader of the enemy, of the mushrikeen. And then he points out Abu Jahl to this young man, because he was young. And... Now the young man to his left, guess what he says? He says, uncle, 
asked him the same question. Which one's Abu Jahl? The reason why they are whispering is because these two brothers were competing with each other and they didn't want the other one to know. They were whispering to Abdul Rahman ibn Auf so that the other one doesn't hear. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf said, when I showed Abu Jahl to them and the battle started, see that man whom uh, it was like a crowd of people were around him because he was the leader. Of course the enemy is going to protect their leader. Okay? Abdul Rahman ibn Auf said in the narration, they flew at him like falcons. This was in Bukhari. They flew at him as if falcons. They were jumping all over the place and they struck him down. They struck Abu Jahl down, the enemy. Two young men from the Ansar. These two young men, according to one narration, are Mu'adh bin Amr bin Jamuh and Mu'awwadh or Auf bin Asra. In another narration, they are Auf and Mu'awwadh ibn Afra al-Harith, whose mother, who was Afra. In another narration, it says that when they attacked Abu Jahl, the leader of the enemy, when they reached next to him, one of them struck the foot of Abu Jahl. So it flew off, you know, like a kernel of corn flies off. And it made the sound of crack. And then it just flew off. But then Ikrimah saw that and he struck Mu'adh on his shoulder, one of the men. And he tore off his arm. So one of the brothers. However, the arm remained hanging while he was fighting other people. It was hanging by the flesh of his side. So like some of the muscle and tendons. So one of his brothers, his, the joint is cut, but it's just dangling. And he's fighting other people. Mu'az said, I carried on fighting, dragging my arm behind me until it started bothering me. So I put my foot on the arm and tore it off. Subhanallah. This is a young man at that time. That's quite a thing to do. Tear off your own arm. Abu Jahl was killed or was wounded severely by these two young men. Young Ansari men. But he was laying there on the ground and he wasn't dead in his last moments. Do you know what happened? Abu Jahl. The Prophet ﷺ said and asked the Sahaba, find out what happened to Abu Jahl. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, I went to the battlefield. And when I realized that there was a man laying in front of me, and that was Abu Jahl, the leader of the enemy. So I stepped over his neck with my foot. And when I recognized him, I put my foot on his neck. He had once held me captive in Mecca and he kicked me and tortured me. So he asked him, Allah has put you to shame. Allah has shamed you. Look at you lying here and the Muslims, we've defeated you. Abu Jahl said, and how has he shamed me? Aren't I the most noble man that you've ever killed? Even when he's dying, tell me which side won the day. Even Abu Jahl, look at this Fir'aun of his people. Even when he's dying, he's arrogant to the last moment. He said yeah, the results were the Muslims won. In another narration, it says that Abdullah bin Mas'ud was, laying, uh, was holding a fine sword. Abu Jahl was holding a fine sword and he was protecting himself. While I had a poor sword, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. So he struck his arm, so his sword fell off. And then he carried his sword and he sat on his chest to sever his head. And when he was over his head, he said, لَقَدْ إِخْتَقَيْتَ مُعْتَقَيْتَ سَعْرًا Like he said, you have climbed a very high building. You're on top of my chest. That's a very high building for you. He is arrogant even when he's dying. He's telling Abdullah bin Mas'ud, the Muslim, for you to be on top of my chest is too high of a building for you. Because you are a herdsman. You're a ra'i. You, you take uh, sheep and you... You know? And then he said, I severed his head. And I took it to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, as, it was as though I was walking on air. I was flying on air when I was taking the head of the leader of the enemy. Okay? Speeding off, happy to tell the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I, this is the head of the enemy. This, O Messenger of Allah, is the head of Allah's enemy. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, is it really by Allah other than whom there's none? I said, yes. And then I threw Abu Jahl's head down in front of the Prophet ﷺ, who then praised Allah In the narration of Imam Ahmad, Rasulullah said, Alhamdulillah, Allah has disgraced you, you enemy of Allah.
This man was the pharaoh of his people. Every nation has a pharaoh. And the pharaoh of our nation was Abu Jahl. Ibn Kathir comments on the death of Abu Jahl. And he says, the death of Abu Jahl came about at the hand of a youth from the Ansar. Thereafter, Abdullah bin Mas'ud was placed over him. So look at who Allah chose to kill the leader of the enemy. Two young men from the Ansar and Abdullah bin Mas'ud. You know what Abdullah bin Mas'ud used to look like? He was very thin. He was like a tiny little man. Okay, one day he was climbing a palm tree and there was wind blowing and it shook his legs. He was that thin. He was very lightweight. And the Sahaba laughed when they saw the thinness of the legs of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, the Muslims. So Rasulullah said, Are you laughing because he has slim legs? In the name of Allah, these legs are heavier on the scale on the day of judgment than the mountain of Uhud. It is not by what pounds you can carry, what your biceps can curl. It is what you have inside your heart, the way that you are. It is not about how strong you are. What is in your heart? When you're in the fear of battle, there's people running away that were muscle builders. And you're standing there. The two young men are standing there waiting to kill the enemy's leader. You don't judge people by worldly standards. How strong the soldier is lives in their heart. How many people in the recent wars actually defected from the armies? US armies, the Russian armies, they defected because they didn't believe. Ibn Kathir said the death of Abu Jahl came about in the hands of a youth and Abdullah bin Mas'ud. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud was placed over him. By this, Allah comforted the believers. This was more effective than if Allah made a bolt of lightning strike down the people on the battle of Badr. Because the Muslims, you know, even they imagine, you know, there's someone on your team, let's say your basketball team, and he's like the worst basketball player. Worst basketball player. He's like really bad. And the rest of the team carries this person. And imagine this person scores 50 goals. What is that going to do to the rest of your team? The team is going to be like, whoa. Yeah, man, we're going to win today for sure. That's exactly what happened by the, these two young men. And subhanAllah, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, who was so lightly built, killing the leader of the enemy. يُعَزِّبُهُمُ اللَّهُ بِأَيْدِيكُمْ وَيُخْزِيهِمْ وَيَنْصُرْكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَيَشْفِي صُدُورَ قَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَيُذْهِبْ غَيْظَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَيَتُوبُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ سبحان الله سورة توبة 9, 14 and 15 Fight them Allah will punish them by your hands Not by lightning not by uh, natural disasters, by your hands. Allah will punish them. And subhanAllah, Allah will disgrace them. And they will give you victory over them and satisfy the breasts of the believing people. And remove the fury in their hearts. And Allah turns in forgiveness to whomever he wills. And Allah is knowing and wise. So there is an element of revenge. You know the Muslims had been wronged. For 13 years, they had been wronged. And they didn't fight back. So Allah is saying here that now 13 years I told you to wait, today you get your reward. Now you see the fate of the enemies. The angels are coming down, killing them, slaying them. The enemy is killed by kids. You know, one of the fa- famous fighters, he was called Abul Qirsh, the one with the pot belly. So he was covered in armor. He was from the enemy side. You could only see his eyes. Zubair ibn Awam attacked him in the Battle of Badr. This is a man covered from head to toe in steel. Zubair ibn Awam with his javelin was able to strike him right in the area where the opening of the eyes is. Okay? Now, the opening was so small that the spear got stuck. But he was still fine. So Zubair steps on his javelin with his foot. And he forces it deep into the head of Abu Qirsh, who was like armor. When he pulls out his javelin, the blade was bent so bad. And this shows you the strength of Zubair ibn Awan, one of the Muslims. It was amazing that such a short blade, you can bend it like this. So Rasulullah asked to keep this javelin as a souvenir. And when Rasulullah passed away, Abu Bakr asked for the javelin. And when Abu Bakr passed away, Umar asked for it. And when Umar 
passed away, Zubair got it again. But then Uthman asked Zubair to give it to him. So Zubair hands it over to the Khalifa Uthman bin Affan. And when Uthman passes away, Ali takes it. And when Ali, Abi Talib, takes it away, uh, he dies. Uh, then the son of Abdullah ibn Zubair takes it. What was the death toll? 70 mushrikeen were killed. 70 were taken. Prisoners of war. No deaths among the Muslims. And there were 14, no, uh, 14 deaths and no prisoners of war. Six from an Muhajirun. Six from Khazraj. And two from al aws This was the death toll of the Battle of Badr. Rasulullah wasallam. And subhanAllah, I'm going to narrate to you one last story of the Battle of Badr. I cannot give you the entire picture, but I hope in the last two or three khutbahs I've given you enough of a picture of it. There was something that happened at the beginning of the Battle of Badr before the battle started. And I want to narrate to you this story for a reason. Because I want to speak about this as the last story about the Battle of Badr. Which is that beginning at the beginning of the Battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ was employing ranks. Like, you know when we stand up for a prayer? You need to be straight, right? So he wanted to straighten the rows. And so he had an arrow in his hand. And he was inspecting the lines to see if they were straight, right? And he was straightening the lines as if we straighten it for prayer. And he was holding an arrow in his hand. And he came up to one of the soldiers, Shawad bin Ghuzayyah who was protruding a bit from the line. So this is the line he was protruding. So he pushes him back with the arrow, back into line. So he was protruding out, and then he went back. So Shawad bin Ghuzayya said, Oh Rasulullah, you hurt me. I want to retaliate. Subhanallah. So the Sahaba were shocked. This is right before the Battle of Badr. And you're saying to your leader that I want to retaliate against you because you pushed me back into line with uh, the tip of the arrow, which didn't even hurt. So he said to the Prophet ﷺ, I want to retaliate. Now put yourself in this, uh, in this position. I just want you to put yourself in this position. You are the leader of the Muslims. You are the president of Medina. Okay? You have an entire army next to you that is willing to die on one command of yours. And one of your own soldiers said something like this to you. What would you do? What would you do to discipline that soldier? Guess what the Prophet ﷺ did? What was his response? You know here, one of his soldiers is saying, you hurt me. Uh, it's your mistake for not being in line. Right? But Rasulullah wasallam exposed his stomach. And he said, go ahead. Retaliate. If, if that's what you want, go ahead. Retaliate. Hit me back. He didn't get angry. He didn't get upset. This is our leader. I want you to just think about this example. If you were the leader, is that how you would behave? He put up his cloth and he said, retaliate. Hit me back. That's fair. He didn't court-martial him. He didn't throw him in jail. He didn't torture him. What did he do? He spoke out of line to the leader of the army before they were going into battle. The Prophet ﷺ knew. So he exposed his stomach and he said, retaliate. If I hurt you, hit me back. So Sawad ibn Ghuzayya radiallahu anhu hugs the Prophet ﷺ and he kisses his stomach. That was his retaliation. مَا حَمَلَكَ عَلِ النَّاسِ Why did you do that? So Wad ibn Ghuzayya said, O Messenger of Allah, you can see what's about to happen to us Muslims. I wanted my last contact with you to be my skin touching yours. لا إله إلا الله So Wad ibn Ghuzayya is saying, O Messenger of Allah, you know what's about to happen. We're gonna die in a few moments. We're facing death right in front of us. I wanted the last thing in my dunya, in, on earth, my skin touching your skin. This is how they love the Prophet ﷺ. Sawad ibn Ghuzayya, who was hurt by the Prophet ﷺ accidentally, used that opportunity to do what? To hug the Prophet ﷺ and kiss him. They didn't see it that the Prophet ﷺ was leading them to their deaths. You know, like uh, the army troops, if you ever have a have a um, you know, barbecue with the army troops, personnel, military personnel of a country, let's say Russia, USA, Australia even. What do they say about their leaders when they've just gone into a war and fought and come back? They don't have good things to say about their leaders. And what is the Sahaba saying about their leaders? They were willingly giving up their lives. They were willing to face death for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal and His servant and His messenger. 
They believed in him. The Prophet wasallam then made dua for Suad. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless him. Subhanallah. You know, it is this love of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam that I want you to learn from these khutbas. How the Sahaba understood and loved the Prophet wasallam, Like no leader was ever loved before. It wasn't just words. It wasn't just words on their tongue. Poetry, singing his praise. No. Love for them meant... What? We will put our lives on the line for you. Everything. We will lay it down for you, O Messenger of Allah. Our wealth, our money, our family, our children. Everything is sacrificed for you. When it comes to you, we're willing to give our own children up. We ask Allah Azzawajal to grant us this love of the Prophet ﷺ. The love of his message, the love of his sunnah, the love of his way. And not just to make the people claim that they love the Prophet ﷺ and claim that they are Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us love the Sharia. The plant that he placed inside the hearts of the Sahaba, we want that. We want that plant in our hearts. And it gets adorned in our hearts. So for them, it was iman that they loved. They didn't love their cars. They didn't love their houses. They didn't even love their own selves and their own children more than they loved iman. One of them is that they dislike to go back to kufr as if they were thrown back into the fire. You would rather be thrown into a burning uh, flame than give up iman. You love your Islam so much. This is when you will taste the sweetness of iman. Faith. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make ease. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.